Hello, my name is Jim Castle, and I'd like to talk to you today about a, a little known or slightly remembered industry in America called ice harvesting. In the uh, early 1800s, it was kind of a, a little thing that farmers would do on their own little pond to make enough ice. There wasn't uh, a great connection of uh, shipping at that time. It wasn't easy to move ice a long way, so everybody cut their own. The industry didn't get started in America until about 1847. In Chicago at that time, they cut 2,000 tons of ice. By the 1880s, the breweries and the slaughterhouses, packing industry, I would be Chicago stockyards, used 350,000 tons of ice. So you went from two to 350. It's a pretty big increase. And a lot of that was due to rail shipping. But uh, the industry goes way back. The earliest recorded uh, talk about harvesting and storing ice that I could find was 1780 BC. They were cutting ice from the glaciers and bringing it down. In uh, Ecuador, there's one man still doing that. This guy's 83 years old at the time the video was made, and he would walk 18 miles to the glacier uphill. At that time, he'd cut six 60-pound blocks of ice out of the glacier, wrap them in straw, tie them onto his three burrows, and take them back down. Now, imagine trying to do that at high altitude at 63 years, or at 73 years old. <laughs> they knew what work was back then. But in America, ice was cut on ponds and rivers. We lived near the Great Lakes, a lot of ice on the Great Lakes. You'd think that'd be a great place to harvest it, but the weather broke up the ice constantly as it was forming, and it wasn't flat enough. So the ponds, and the rivers were where we cut most of our ice. Show you a little bit about how they went about it. We have a, a picture in this catalog here of what's called an ice plow. And an ice plow was hooked to a horse and it would be dragged across the ice and that plow would be used to make the first line across the pond. Incidentally, a pond would yield about, if it were 14 to 16 inches thick, would yield approximately 1,000 tons of ice per acre. So ice was a heavy, heavy industry. At any rate, they would take that plow and they would cut a line as long as they wanted across that ice, straight as could be. Then they'd turn around and come back. They had a horse or two horses hooked to that plow. Man would guide the plow and cut deeper and deeper into that ice, six or eight inches deep if they could do it. And then they would take another piece of that plow that stuck out about two or three feet from the plow with a, a flat piece of sheet metal that fit into the original groove. That would be the guide for the second groove. And they would cut a parallel groove to that. And they would keep doing that until they had gridded the whole area they wanted to cut. Next thing they would do is take a spud like this, weighs 17 pounds, big weight on the end of it, and they would take that and pound into the ice until they got a hole sufficient to fit a saw in. And this is where the work starts. This would be the type of saw they would use the handle could be rotated so you could store it and when you were ready to use it it would be done like that perpendicular to the saw you'd stand like this and saw up and down like a pit saw in order to cut your groove and they would go and they would cut the next groove and now you've got two cut pieces and a long strip of free ice you have to cut one piece out at the end so you can start removing the ice, and that was probably the hardest piece to get out. They would take and cut a perpendicular groove and saw that into a block two to three foot square. 
They take a large pair of what they call skidding tongs. This is a pair of skidding tongs. They're very large because you have to get a hold of a big block of ice. And the handles are long because now you're standing on the ice and you're getting below the water level to get a hold of that ice. And in order to get it out, you would push on it and let go and the block of ice would go down and then it would come up out of the water two or three inches and you'd try and grab a hold of the edge of it and pull it up a little higher. Then someone else would get a better hold on it and the two of you would pull that block straight up out of that hole. And that would start the process. Then you would either saw the next block and remove it or you would take this spud bar with a blade on it and you would punch down on that piece of ice where you wanted to split it. Usually, if it was done right, you could split that with one or two shots. Then they could move that down to the original hole and pull it out. And so it went all the way down that row. Then you'd take the big ice saw again and you'd cut another groove and you'd either, if you want those blocks precision, you'd measure and cut with the saw. And if you weren't too worried about that, you'd use the spud bar, it was much quicker. You'd pull those blocks out of the water and drag them with the big tongs you used to start it. These also have a long handle, so they're easier to drag with. Those are called drag tongs for that purpose. You drag them over to a wooden, uh, it's kind of a conveyor, has runners on it, kind of like an upside down sled. You got two steel runners and wood sides and that was the, the guide for pulling them up onto the wagon. This little piece here is a representative piece that I bent up. This would be of course much bigger. The points would hook onto the block of ice. The rope would be tied to this end and that would be used to pull them up that, that little run. From there, they'd be loaded on a wagon, taken to the ice house. Possibly the ice house was located close enough that they could slide them over. They'd go on to a, a little elevator that was made to haul them up. As you fill the ice house, these blocks get higher and higher and you have to pull them up higher and higher so you'd have a horse tied to a, to a rope, went through a pulley in the top of this conveyor and it would pull those blocks up to wherever level you're starting to load. You'd slide them off on another ramp and you'd use a tool like this. This one here is called a car hook. Car being a railroad car, not an automobile. Remember, no autos yet. And the end has that same duck build cross section to the points. One's bent back so you could hook the ice and pull it. The other one is on an angle forward so you could push it. They'd push that block into position in the ice house and they'd keep doing that all day long. Incidentally, they worked a 10 to 12 hour day and uh, the dollar a day roughly in the 1880s. So pretty labor intensive. Not much skill involved and a lot of work for the money. And once you got it into the ice house, they would uh, pack it with, uh, put a layer of sawdust on top once it was full. You didn't put any layers of sawdust in between the blocks so you couldn't slide them. Once you had that done, you were ready to wait for summer, a big enough ice house some of the biggest ice houses were 50,000 tons of ice. Typical ice house was 2,700 tons. And that ice house would be roughly 30 by 100 feet, about 45 feet tall. So a lot of ice went into these houses. The more ice you had, the longer you, it would last. If the ice froze, say you pulled the blocks out and they're sitting on the lake and they freeze to the surface. They'd use a, a big mallet like this, just part of a, a tree limb with a couple of iron rings on it. And that would be used to bang that ice free. There was a bar that looks 
similar to the spud bar, only it has a curve called a summer bar. Now, I don't know exactly how that was used. It's in the catalog, but with that curve, I suspect it was used on the floor of the ice house to get under the next block and pry it up. That would break it free so they could slide it out of the ice house and use it. Ice houses were constructed with about a two foot thick wall and that wall would be filled with sawdust. Sawdust was a good insulator. Ice house had to be well drained because you really didn't want to soak the sawdust in the wall or it would lose that insulating quality. So there was a special construction considerations in an ice house. And a lot of them are still standing today as warehouses. Most of them are long gone. On the Hudson River between New York and Albany, there were uh, at one time 136 ice houses. To give you some idea just how big an industry that was. It was actually the second biggest industry in the uh, export industry in the country, only exceeded by cotton in the 1880s. There was a fellow named, uh, uh, let's see, what was his name? Fred uh, Tudor. Fred Tudor in 1850, I believe it was 1852, no, 1806. In 1806, Fred Tudor opened a business out of Boston, shipping ice around the world by boat. He had insulated boats, he'd load them with ice, and uh, ice is a perishable product. He shipped it all the way to India, and uh, by the time it got to India, he'd lost half his product. Well, you lose half the product, you charge double the money. So there's still a profit in it if they need it bad enough. But uh, very perishable, when you got to India, they better have a good ice house because they didn't want to lose any more of it than they already had. Now, uh, the ice industry didn't really get going in America until about 1842. Railroads, Mr. Vanderbilt, decided that there was money in shipping beef. And Chicago was a big hub for meat packing because it was centrally located. They could get the beef from the Midwest, they could ship it to the East. Railroads made ice a huge commodity in Chicago area. They bought ice from, uh, well, they bought it from Minnesota, and uh, they bought it from Michigan. They couldn't furnish enough of their own. They started out, uh, I'm trying to remember how many, I think they started out with 2,000 tons of ice in 1842, and by 1880, the beer and beef packing industry were using 350,000 tons in a year. The biggest use was definitely the packing industries. The Union Stockyards started in 1865, ran till, 18, or till 1971, and they were the, the meat packers of the world. The biggest meat packing company in the world by 1924. And they used fantastic amounts of ice. The, uh, the way you would start out, <clears throat> Get a little bit away from ourselves. The way you would start out to cut ice on the lakes or the ponds or the rivers was to take an auger like this and you drill a hole through that ice until you got enough of a hole to fit a ruler down. This is a logging scale, but they would use like a yardstick with a little hook on the bottom. You'd put that through the hole, you'd hook the bottom of the ice. If you had 14 to 16 inches of ice, you were in pretty good shape. They would start cutting. This tongs here would be used to handle the blocks once they were out of the water and ready to be picked up and put on top of another set of blocks. It can grab a big block, but it has short handles. 
So if you grab it on the ground, you got room to pick that block up. A little bit different tongs for a little bit different purpose. Now, if you're gonna be dragging that plow across the ice to score it before you cut and remove the blocks, you're gonna need a horse or two horses, and that team is not gonna wanna slip on the ice. You've already plowed off all the snow. You got the surface down to reasonably good ice. So they would take their horses and fit them with special shoes that had very long caulks on them. These would dig into the ice so there was no slipping. Same thing the logging companies used when they were pulling logs in the winter. If you were using mules, interesting thing about a mule is it has a different hoof, different shape to the hoof. A mule has a long, narrow hoof. Horse has a rounded hoof. If you were using a team of oxen, oxen are a little different. They have two separate shoes per hoof. They have a cloven hoof like a deer, and it wants to move independently, so they were shot independently. It took eight shoes to do an ox. While you're working in the winter, snow can build up inside the horse or mule hoof. And if he gets too big a snowball in there, the horse will go lame. Teamster has a tool for that. This is called a snow knocker, sometimes called a Yankee snow knocker because down south they don't have snow. Has a little spring clip on one end. You'll always see that clip on it. That's how you know what it is because it was attached to the harness of the horse and hung there on the wagon or sleigh. Anytime the horse started going lame, Teamster could take it off and he could chip the snowball out of that hoof. If there was a nail loosening up, he had a hammer to reclench it. Now, you've cut your ice, 1,000 tons per acre. You put them on this little tramway that you've made with these guides and hauled it up into the ice house. Three foot or two foot thick walls full of sawdust to keep it warm or keep it cold. And then you would put sawdust on top of the top layer, about two feet of sawdust on that to keep it in good shape. Once you uh, are ready to sell that ice, depending on who you're selling it to, you got to get it back out of the ice house. That uh, bar that I mentioned, the summer bar, is good for breaking it free. You take your car hook, drag the blocks over, put them back on the elevator, and down they went. If you were servicing the railroads, you'd have an ice house right near the railroad. You'd have a special dock the train would pull up to, open the cars up, slide these big blocks in, usually about three by three foot, and way close to uh, 300 pounds. A cubic foot of ice weighs about 57 pounds. So you can figure <laughs> it's gonna get heavy fast. All these cars had to be filled with ice periodically. They would go X amount of miles. When the uh, ice started getting low, they'd pull up to another ice house and they'd fill up again. And it was a tremendous draw on the ice industry to keep these railroads going. That was uh, part of why they located the Union Stockyards where they did. Now, when you uh, were distributing ice to the local families, people had refrigerators back then. Not a refrigerator like you think. What we call a refrigerator now is electric. And when they invented the electric refrigerator, we had to change the name of the icebox. If you look at an old 1910 catalog, you're gonna see that the icebox is referred to as a refrigerator. So the icebox term was invented to differentiate the old icebox from the new electric refrigerator. Tools for the house. Blocks of ice were carried by uh, the ice man who would deliver it. 
There were in Chicago, I believe at one time, they had 875 people employed in moving ice. So it was, uh, <laughs> it's quite a job to deliver the stuff. You had two or three days a week, you had to get new ice for your ice box. And this little tool here is kind of unique. This was the lady's friend. It would pick up a small block of ice. When you picked up on the handle, this point moves in against this point and grips the block of ice. Very convenient, not much use for it nowadays. If you wanted to split a block of ice, you had a multi-tined ice pick. You could use that, cut a line across that block of ice and cut it in half. Ice came in uh, 50, no, 25, 50, and 75 pound or 100 pound blocks, typically, brought up by the ice man, carried across his back with a special pair of tongs. He had a small pair of tongs for two-handed work. One man could use this or a man on either side could use it. But to carry the blocks up three flights of stairs and put it in the lady's ice box, they used a one-handed tongs. This one has a special handle. When you pick up on it, it automatically pulls both points together. They could grab a block of ice, sling it over their back. They had a big leather, piece of leather running down their back to keep the water off them. And that would extend down close to their knees. And they would take that block of ice with one hand and climb however many stairs they had to climb to get up there. It was a tough job being an ice man. If that block of ice wasn't the right size, if it needed to be reduced in size, you had another tool called a shaver. And this tool here has four points, not quite like the ice pick. And these would be used to sculpt that ice. If it stuck out too far on one side, you could shave it off easily. You could also use this tool. Bartenders use these tools to make ice for drinks. They would get their ice in big blocks and they would simply shave off what they wanted. If you wanted to do a lot of shaving, you had another tool. This is a wooden handled version. And this is an iron handled version, typically used on the lake or on the rivers when you're out cutting ice. These were used to shape the bigger blocks. You could cut a lot more at a time with them. Another way to shape those was the hand saw. Pretty much like the big saw, this one has large teeth on it. Another one here looks more like a wood saw, but the teeth are different. And what the difference was, uh, the big one I imagine would cut faster. This one more for trimming. But the interesting thing about these ice saws is they had an iron handle. Why an iron handle, I have never found out. But in the catalog, the ice saws have iron handles. Sounds like a bad idea. You lay it down, it freezes to the ice. But that's an easy way to tell an ice saw. Now, ice harvesting, like I said, went back to the, uh, at least the 1700 BC and probably a lot further back. We just don't have any record of it. Ice at that time was usually stored in the ground. Ground will end up averaging the, the average temperature of the area. If you have a zero to 80 degree range of heat in uh, summer and winter, you're going to have ice, or the temperature below ground at roughly 40 degrees. Another way to get cool was to have a spring house. If you had a farm with a natural spring, the water coming out of that spring is going to have that average temperature, probably somewhere around 40 degrees. You'd build a box around that spring to raise the water level up where you could use it. You'd put your meat, your vegetables, your dairy products in a container and immerse them in that water. And that would keep it cool. 
Ice only had to last through the, through the summer. If it got to the winter, you're back to cold weather. So it didn't have to last forever. Now another video that I saw a while back was a gentleman in Ecuador who actually mined ice from a glacier on a volcano. And this fellow is, at the time the video was made, was 73 years old. He would walk 18 miles up that glacier, up to the glacier, in a day. He would mine six 60-pound blocks of ice, wrap them in straw, put them on three burrows, two on each one, tie them on and walk back down. And all of this work done at high altitude. <laughs> we don't know what work is nowadays. So this would be the type of pick he used. We didn't seem to use, this is actually a coal pick. And from all I've seen of the, of the tools, the catalogs I've read, we didn't use a coal pick for anything. But that was one of his primary tools. He had an ice axe, he had a pick, and he had one of these spud bars with a point on one end and a blade on the other. What we used for an ice axe was this. It has a special point on it, sometimes called a duckbill point because it's triangular in cross section. For some reason, that was just the perfect point for digging into ice. The other end has a long rounded end on it, sharp. There's another axe that looks just like this that has a straight edge. What the difference is and why, I don't know. But uh, besides having cocks on the horses, people had to avoid slipping on the ice. And this here is an ice caulk for boots. It would be this one here probably worn on the instep of the boot. It has long points on it and two straps to go around the ankle and hold it on. And that would be what the man would use when he's walking on the ice doing that work. And this tool here it's called an ice shaver, and this was uh, something that mom could use if she pulled a block out of the ice box. She could scrape along the top of that. It works just like a wood plane, and the shaved ice builds up inside. That can be dumped into a glass, and maple syrup or some kind of fruit syrup would be poured over it, and that would create a, a confection. That's Exactly the tool shown in the video of the guy in Ecuador. That's what they used the ice that he brought down. And they preferred that ice because it was perfectly clean ice. Got to remember if they were making ice mechanically, it was made from rivers and lakes that were further down and probably more polluted. That got to be the problem in later days of ice manufacturing. It, it was only used for cooling because it was too polluted to put in your drinks. So the ice industry was at its peak in the late 1800s. Mechanical uh, methods of making ice with the evaporation process came in about 1880. And it developed slowly. It didn't give the lake ice much competition right away because it was expensive and they couldn't make enough ice. Demand for ice was huge by the turn of the century. But it did develop and uh, well by the time of World War I it was taking most of the business. I think 80 percent of the ice by 1910 was cut on the lakes. By 1920 it was only 10% of the ice used cut on the lakes. So that's the time when, uh, when the machine made ice really took over. But uh, there was a rest, a little uh, 
breathing spot for lake ice about 1914. Now, if you remember, 1914 was the beginning of World War I. The mechanical made ice was all done with the ammonia process. They used ammonia evaporation to create the cold. Well, the government needed ammonia to make ammonium nitrate, and ammonium nitrate was used to make explosives. Well, they didn't have enough ammonia to begin with, and they took the ammonia from all the ice houses. So for a brief period of time, cutting ice on the lakes revived. After that, it was pretty much all machine-made ice. Uh, if you use a cooler in the summer, if you're going on vacation, consider buying block ice instead of ice cubes. Block ice is still available. If you go to the gas station and buy a bag of ice, ask them if they have it in blocks. Chances are they do. And that block in your cooler, because it's a solid block, will last a lot longer. If you're cooling beer for a tailgate party, get your ice cubes. But if you're going traveling, you want ice in a cold cooler for several days, try the block. Okay, that's about as much as I know about ice cutting. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, you can check out some of my other, other videos if you like on YouTube. There are several of them. I'll give you a list. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this one and learned something. Thank you very much for watching.